Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chief Executive Officer. And you have been watching Governor Rick Snyder as he's kicked off the Detroit Regional Chamber's 2012 Mackinac Policy Conference. He said, don't make it a nice conference. Let's get some things done. He pushed the points of saying that Michigan is back and that we should be selling to the globe. And now is not the time to be satisfied. And he urged all the business leaders here and the politicians to use this conference as an accelerator. So we're going to keep it going here this afternoon with the next session. It's focusing on innovation, entrepreneurship entrepreneurship as a catalyst for economic recovery. Let's go ahead and take a listen to Josh Linkner, who is the moderator and he's the CEO of Detroit Venture Partners. Put this region on the map originally. Great inventors like Henry Ford. Well, today there's a whole new batch of entrepreneurs that are diversifying the economy, that are creating jobs, urban density, and hope. And we're very lucky to have some of those with us today. And I'm excited to shake things up a bit with a panel on entrepreneurship. So with that, I'd like to invite our first panelist, the incredible art collector and patron of the arts, the helicopter pilot, and most importantly, the CEO of Start Garden, Rick DeVos. <laughs> Next up, we have someone who started as a Michiganian, Michigander, she went on to Silicon Valley and around the world to create great success as an entrepreneur. But rather than staying away, she came back and she's helping to contribute and rebuild our economy, Ms. Angel Gambino. Our next panelist is someone who is not only a venture capitalist, not only a longtime contributor to this region, also a terrific athlete, apparently, and, uh, and a good runner, um, the CEO of the Renaissance Venture Capital Fund, Mr. Chris Rizek. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, uh, salsa and hummus extraordinaire, friend of Jimmy Buffett, and President and Vice Chair of Garden Fresh Salsa, Mr. Dave Zilko. <laughs> Welcome. So we're going to have a little discussion here, and uh, the exciting part as well is we'll be taking questions from the audience. So we'll look forward to having a good, healthy, interactive dialogue on entrepreneurship. First, starting off, and maybe we'll start with Dave and just kind of work this way, could you give us a brief intro of yourself, your organization, and the role that you see entrepreneurship playing in Michigan's recovery? Would love to. Uh, first of all, it's an honor to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dave Zilko. Uh, I've lived in Michigan my entire life, um, went to Michigan State. Uh, I actually spent a summer in France, just fell in love with the food and wine culture, and went to the East Coast to get a, an MBA in marketing. When I came back, uh, I started the way a lot of food entrepreneurs do it. Uh, I literally created a line of marinades on my kitchen counter and sent them to what was then the buyer of Dayton Hudson, Marshall Fields. He called me, he said these are the best marinades I've ever had, and he placed a 400 case order. I had, not only did I have any place to make it, uh, I didn't have any money. So I applied for a Discover card, $2,500 Discover card credit card loan, I got turned down for it. So my girlfriend at the time co-signed it, and that's how I funded my company. Now, I, I married her, so it was a good investment in her part. <laughs> so uh, I've, I've got this place. I make the first 300,000 bottles by hand. Uh, I've got air conditioning, ironically, in this place, but I have no heat. My landlord lives in the Bahamas for tax reasons. You can take it from there. And I build this company. I buy a mustard company. And in the summer of 2002, I'm in uh, New York at a food show, and I met a man named Jack Aronson who five years beforehand had founded a company called Garden Fresh Gourmet at a little 1,200 square foot restaurant in Ferndale, Michigan. Uh, when I say Jack was a struggling restaurateur, I mean it. He wasn't dead. He had a uh, uh, declared bankruptcy to hold on to his lease. And he says, look, I was just trying to pay my electric bill. And he took a five gallon bucket and peeled onions by hand and in 15 minutes made what is today Garden Fresh Salsa. So I met him and he started in the back of his restaurant, then he moved to an old blockbuster video store, and then he built this 25,000 square foot salsa plant. He and I were having lunch after we met in New York, and he said, you know what, I think I might have overbuilt. Why don't you move your company into mine, outsource your manufacturing to me, I'll give you a free office, and you can do what you want, but I, I need the revenue to, to pay my rent. So I did, 
And uh, our talent seemed to complement each other, and somehow I got them liquored up enough to let me become partners with them. That was in really 2002, 2003. The company did $4.6 million uh, that year. Uh, this year, we're on pace to do $110 million. And I. I don't mean this to be a, a commercial for Garden Fresh, but you and I were talking about this. So uh, Garden Fresh is now the number one fresh salsa in both the United States and Canada. Uh, we just overtook Kraft as the third largest hummus manufacturer in the United States. Uh, we're the number one brand of tortilla chips in uh, the deli in the United States. Uh, we have the exclusive North American rice to Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville brand for the deli line. Uh, we employ absolutely cutting edge technology. We pasteurize a lot of our food products in 43 degree water. Uh, there's only 100 of these machines in the world. We have two of them. My partner and I were invited to Sweden last year where these are produced to give a presentation on everything we're doing with it. Um, we employ 423 people in Ferndale. We're the largest employer there. We have four plants all in Michigan. Uh, Nestle tried to buy us in 2008. Pepsi tried to buy us in 2009 and 2010. Um, and all this is happening in Michigan, so it really can be done here. Right. Hi, I'm Chris Reisick, and again, and, and as Dave said, it's really an honor being here today. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly tell you, I was back in the 90s, I had a pretty good practice as a, as a lawyer and was doing okay, and then the gentleman who was up here about 10 minutes ago speaking for 15 minutes uh, lured me away from my practice to get into venture capital with him, and so uh, the governor and I uh, ran two venture funds together. And then back in 2008, uh, Business Leaders for Michigan had a concept that was pretty unique around the nation. The idea was there was a recognition that the state was short on capital, and I had experienced that in my time in venture capital. And we needed more capital, and we needed, needed more connectivity. Really, it was a discussion of collaboration five years before this conference today. And so uh, back then, in the heart of darkness, in December of 2008, uh, in a matter of six weeks, uh, some of the largest and most important businesses in the state came together and uh, collected about $40 million to start a novel venture capital fund of funds. Uh, and I was asked to run it. And, and the concept was uh, to go around the country and, and in the Midwest, find the very best ca uh, venture capital funds, and make a small investment in them under the condition that they would then start getting active looking at the technology developed in Michigan. Uh, and it was novel that the private sector had done this. This hadn't happened anywhere else in the country. And to date, we are now over 100 million in size. And we've had a, a great collaboration of uh, major companies like DTE, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, Meyer. Uh, we have foundations like the Dow Foundation and the Kellogg Foundation, and most recently we have Wayne State University involved. So it really is a collaboration behind the idea that we can put capital out, uh, and, and what will happen is those venture funds will invest in the state, and the investors that have come into our fund have agreed if there are interesting startup companies, they will get engaged testing products, potentially becoming customers. So consequently, our relatively small venture capital fund, and I know it's 100 million, but that's relatively small in the world of venture capital. Thus far, we've been able to leverage that to bring 15 times that amount of investment uh, into Michigan from around the country and have helped create a number of new companies uh, with the cooperation of these venture capital funds. Um, so we're, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, on, on a side note from a, an entrepreneurial standpoint, about eight years ago, I recognized as a music fan the need for um, the need for sitting here in Detroit, the need for a soul music uh, place online, and so created what is called soultracks.com, and so operating out of my kitchen, uh, we operate the number one soul music website in the country, too. So. So I am really excited to be here. I was thinking as I was walking around that the last time I was here was actually for the state debate championships when I was in high school. So uh, just a couple years ago, of course, right? <laughs> so it's really great to be back here. Um, and I'm honored to be with such an amazing group of people. Um, I pretty much started off my career uh, practicing law as well in DC and got my kind of dream job um, as Director of Business and Legal Affairs, a job well beyond uh, my experience and my view at that time. 
for the Humane Society of the United States working on environmental and wildlife issues. And, you know, it was my grand ambition to really change the world. And as I was there on Capitol Hill and doing the best I could to do just that, I realized that there were other ways I could probably be much more effective at uh, changing the world. And at that time, um, uh, we had this thing emerging called the Internet. And uh, I thought, this thing's going to be big. And so um, I decided to uh, get out of the kind of more risk averse practice of law and jump straight into uh, startup mode. And so I helped um, both big companies like Wells Fargo and First Union start up their first um, internet businesses, their first online uh, e-commerce and transactional businesses. And I also helped some of the first internet companies, a lot of the big brands that you know, uh, come to life. And as a part of that, I decided to go off and start my own um, uh, company, an online games company, uh, with a bunch of other uh, entrepreneurs called Gameplay.com. We floated that business, um, segue into uh, heading up uh, digital for the BBC, and then heading up uh, the commercial corporate strategy digital um, businesses for all of the Viacom brands uh, internationally. Then I decided to um, get back into the heart of my blood as an entrepreneur um, and start up another company, which we um, were very successful at growing uh, in just a couple of years. We ended up selling the business for $850 million um, to uh, AOL Time Warner. So um, as a new mom at that time, I decided, well, this is a great position to be in. I've had a few successful um, exits from my own businesses or businesses that I came very, very early on in. Uh, so I decided to uh, travel a bit with my son and enjoy some beach time and, uh, and then invest in other businesses. So I'm an angel investor um, in, in businesses in South America, Europe, and the US, uh, mainly digital media businesses. And uh, I had spent some time down in South America where, you know, Brazil was just booming while the rest of us were really struggling. And as I was trying to uh, really pivot my business uh, social media platform there, which was called the Facebook of Latin America, and I thought, well, maybe eventually Facebook will be the Facebook of Latin America. We should do something about this. So we pivoted that business, and uh, it's a very profitable, uh, successful business across the region. And once, uh, once I did that, I decided to come back, so it was just in time for my uh, great uh, summers in Michigan. And, uh, and I decided, okay, now is my time to really make a difference uh, to Detroit. I'd always been really passionate about um, making our city uh, really come back, as we heard about, but even eclipse the former heyday status that, that we all are familiar with. So I was on a plane to uh, New York, and uh, I was sitting you know, next to a couple of people, and it was, it was funny because we got chatting. We had an hour and a half on the tarmac. And uh, they said, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, you know, I've been living around the world, and I've decided to come back to Michigan and really make a difference. And I've just put an offer in on a derelict hotel in Corktown. And my vision is to create a tech, retail, and creative industry cluster and to create density in Corktown and make it the coolest place that people come from all over to visit. And that, that will hopefully expand um, throughout the city and throughout the state. And so the guy sitting next to me, really? Wow, OK, you know, which hotel? And I said, oh, well, it's not far from the train station. And he said, oh, really? Is, is it, you know, which one is it? And so we got to talking, and it turns out I was sitting next to the only other bidder on that property. <laughs> So after I had explained my whole grand vision for this property <laughs> and basically written the business plan for him, uh, we decided very quickly in the, uh, in the limo ride back to uh, Chelsea in New York that we were going to go into business together. And he's actually done the development deal for the uh, train station as well. So now we have, just in the last, just we started this business in September, we now have uh, four properties. We're closing on a fifth property all in the Corktown area. And uh, the one fully operational building has businesses like the Huffington Post and Curved and lots of other exciting internet businesses. Also an amazing Head Start business. So um, it's uh, office space, event space, and retail space. And now we're developing those other properties. And the idea is to leverage my international network, my experience, to really, again, make sure that we eclipse our former heyday status, not crawl our way back to where we were. So I am uh, 
like everybody else here, I think, Michigan born and bred. I had a brief dalliance with California and decided quickly that I missed the grounding and humility of the Midwest. <laughs> uh, so came back here. Uh, I started uh, just over four years ago, actually, started a project in Grand Rapids called Art Prize. Uh, it's It's, it's the world's largest art prize. Uh, and the majority of the prizes are actually allocated by public vote. So the only rules to enter that you have to be 18 and show your work somewhere in a three square mile area of the city. I'm just always curious, who, who's been to the art prize? Can I see a show of hands? Wow, that's pretty awesome. Thank you. Uh, you show your work somewhere in a three square mile area of Grand Rapids and uh, we don't define what art is. We don't want to define what a venue is. Uh, it's this completely freewheeling uh, exceptionally libertarian sort of experience uh, where sides of buildings are transformed, uh, empty office spaces, parking lots, et cetera. Uh, and last year we had over 400,000 visitors come through Grand Rapids and it's really kind of changed uh, both Grand Rapidians' view of their city but also uh, the broader community's view of Grand Rapids. Um, in the last month, uh, my team and I kicked off a new project called Start Garden, uh, which is a $15 million seed fund uh, and the sort of unique twist on that is that every week we're investing $5,000 in two ideas. We're not, it's not business plans, we're very much on the uh, just go uh, sort of end of the, the, the spectrum. So uh, we invest in those, those two ideas at $5,000 each. One of them uh, we select internally, the other is based on uh, public vote. It's a theme, public vote, art prize, yeah. Uh, we just want as many people uh, a part of it as possible. Uh, so from there, we'll go on to invest $20,000, up to a half, uh, half million dollars in any given business as things uh, gain traction. Uh, so that the, the purpose of that $5,000 investment is, is really just to, to validate a, a part of their model. Uh, and it comes from uh, running uh, a, a seed accelerator called Momentum for the past few years in Grand Rapids that uh, was investing uh, small sums in, in a few teams, kind of in a batch process. We found some limitations with that model and, and wanted to move to something that was much more ongoing and, and much smaller, but uh, involved a, a lot more people, so. Yeah. Hey, Josh. Um, I just want to interject really quickly. Uh, there's a reason why I made everybody here suffer through the detail of how humble my origins are and how humble Garden Freshers were, because I never met Rick before today. Uh, but I knew he was going to be on the panel. I've heard about Start Garden, and that is literally the way I got started. That is literally the way Garden Fresh got started. Uh, so I am a huge fan of what you're trying to do, and a five thousand dollars can can literally make all the difference from something not getting started to a fresh salsa company out of Detroit, believe it or not, being the number one fresh salsa company in the world. I just uh, just wish I wouldn't met you. I wish so too. I mean, obviously, it's yeah. worked out well. We'd love to be your partner. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so clearly we have a uh, group of underachievers here. Uh, but, but thank you again for joining us. And I do have some specific questions to get, get the discussion going. Uh, first one, Rick, maybe you could kick us off here. When you think about entrepreneurship and innovation here in the state of Michigan, there's obviously some challenges as well as opportunities. What is one or two of the biggest blockers of entrepreneurship that you're seeing? And what are your ideas on how we can crush them? Yeah, I think I, for me, a lot of it comes back to culture uh, and what are our cultural beliefs and practices around businesses and particularly startup businesses. Uh, the entrepreneurial success of the past, I mean, we were the Silicon Valley of mobility uh, over 100 years ago. Like All these goofballs that were working on screwy things, people thought they were toys uh, at the time. Um, that built you know, incredible industry, uh, but also kind of um, moved us away from, from that sort of dynamic uh, uh, environment and that appetite for the chaos and weirdness that is at the, the very earliest stages of things. Uh, so I think that we need to, to rediscover that love for, for extremely early stage things and realize that startups are not just small versions of big businesses, they're not just small ver versions of, of big, large corporations. Uh, in operating businesses are all about execution. Startups are search engines. They are w trying to find a model that works. Uh, so we need to get much uh, more into that discovery process uh, and 
Obviously, we have a lot of, of experience and ability to execute and take things to scale, which will be good once we have more things that are, are happening like that. So that's what we're, I, I mean, not to, to sales pitch it, but with Starkgarden, that's, that's very much what we're trying to do is get a lot of things going at that very small discovery stage so we can find the, the entrepreneurs, the teams, the ideas that have traction uh, and really fuel them and take them to scale. Dave, hey, question for you. There's a lot of activity going on, and uh, at the same time, as pointed out earlier, there are some challenges. But when you think about what's happening here in Michigan, what are some of the signs that entrepreneurship is, in fact, alive and healthy, despite what we might hear on a national level? You know, I think Rick hit it right. I, I, I am sensing a cultural change. I am sensing a, a change in our mindset. Uh, that things really can be done here. They can be done on a, a national, as the governor was saying, a global scale. Uh, my favorite story uh, along these lines is uh, my partner and I were meeting with our Costco Los Angeles regional buyer. Garden Fresh is the number one fresh salsa nationwide at Costco. The guy's name, believe it or not, is Paul Newman, not the Paul Newman. But here we are in LA meeting with Paul Newman. <laughs> and we're showing him this salsa and he goes, wow, this is the best packaged salsa I've ever had in my life. And he tries it and he goes, this is the best fresh salsa I've ever had in my life. And he's looking at the label and he goes, you two are from Detroit? He goes, what'd you do, get lost coming out of Texas? He goes, I get a million fresh salsas coming here. They're all from you know, either California or, or Texas. And you guys will be making cars in Michigan. Um, you know, who ever heard of a fresh salsa company coming out of Michigan? So um, I do think that our, our culture is changing, that uh, uh, we are adopting a mindset that we can do this and that things like that are possible here. I really do. And we see it every day. I mean, in the city of Detroit a couple years ago, there were zero venture capital firms. Today, there's over a dozen. Um, folks like Detroit Venture Partners, Renaissance, and others are investing in the local economy and not necessarily in automotive. You know, we're investing in digital startups that have the potential to attract young people to our state and, and, um, and create fast scaling companies. Um, so with thinking about that, Angel, I have a question for you. Uh, imagine that you get to be Rick Snyder for the day. You all of a sudden are sitting in the governor's chair, you're ready to rock and roll. What do you do to encourage entrepreneurship here in our state? It's a great question. Um, you know, I have to say that a lot of the key words that the governor used um, during um, his uh, opening words are actually the critical success factors of most um, high tech or digital media businesses today in terms of collaboration. The way we work is, is very, very different. It's, it's much more collaborative than lots of other industries. Um, also, some, you know, innovation being at the core of kind of, you know, what we do. Uh, obviously, technology, digital media is all about um, innovation. Uh, there were a few other. Um, me and businesses that are really successful in the in the new economy. Um, two things that I would have added um, would be um, creating an environment um, and support and resources to ensure iteration is uh, is easier. And what I mean by iteration. You know, I think we did that during, you know, the kind of uh, uh, automotive manufacturing days, early days, um, where we're constantly kind of reinvented. It's those actual mini inventions, right, that, that create these whole new products and whole new industries. The other um, thing that I would say is, you know, so for, for example, you, you can structure your return on investment in lots of different ways. And a lot of times what I see is businesses are actually set the, setting themselves up for failure because they didn't achieve certain targets when the target should actually be about iteration, which you require failure to iterate. You know, the failure is what you really learn from. So um, I would say the other key thing is velocity. So the businesses that are most successful today are able to adapt and change at a much greater speed than ever, ever, ever before. They're able to grow much more quickly than ever before. Groupon's uh, the fastest growing company to ever reach you know, a billion dollar valuation and revenue uh, in, in our history. There are lots of other um, amazing examples. So I think if um, I were in um, his role, I would try to, as much as possible, um, create um, more incentives for local, and I know that there's a, a, a lot of things in place already, but more incentives for investment um, into businesses, so new startups um, that stay here or that have offices or resources, people here um, in the state. I would actually say that for our whole state to be vibrant and vital, we really, really need a thriving um, um, urban city of Detroit. 
Um, I think that I would also want to um, really create some new disincentives for all of the people in Detroit and elsewhere throughout uh, Michigan who own lots of, for example, big businesses, or, or I should say, sorry, big buildings, that uh, they might just be keeping them to code, or they might find that not keeping them to code makes more business sense, so they're not keeping them to, to code. So, and what that means for, you know, for a developer, I'm new into commercial property development, you know, but I'm also working with Westfield, who's the largest retail owner operator in the world. And what I'm starting to learn about regeneration is, you know, is that you really need those disincentives as well, because there are lots of buildings that I would love and, you know, I would love to go buy today in Detroit, you know, and I'm using my own money. I haven't tapped into any, you know, tax incentives, grants, whatever. I haven't tapped into any of that yet. I will start looking at that a lot more. Right now, I think we've got a really small window. I want to buy the key properties straight away. And there are some property owners that are just sitting on them, making our city look like crap, and you know the, the, the way that we've got things structured right now, there aren't as many incentives for other people to come in and buy those properties to have a longer term lead time in terms of developing those properties. Because if you're a really, really smart business person, you, know, you would feel pretty hesitant about investing in certain properties in Detroit. Um, I'm looking at it as a triple bottom line business. I'm looking at it as a long term uh, growth business. Um, I'm also doing it because I'm passionate about our city. If I did it purely on, you know, just the kind of economics of any one of these individual deals, you know, there are some that are, you know, I'd have to say, you know, I don't know, I would, I'd rather go invest in, you know, some other areas. So to some, I would just say more disincentives for, um, for the property owners that are contributing to the blight of our city, making the city still have this appearance of scariness. I would do what the governor is already doing and uh, encouraging the rest of us to create a whole new narrative for Detroit. We have a whole new story that's going on here and not enough of us are telling that new narrative, that new story, and we need to share that. Um, I would say more, incentive, more incentives, uh, tax rights, et cetera, for keeping investment local in new businesses, but what I would also say is that you know, after spending as much time across you know, the, the world as I have had. You know, there are lots of places that have really good economies where it's free to get a college education. I mean, that to us is a radical idea, but it's common in other places, as long as you keep up certain, you know, grade point averages. I would think about really, really radical ideas that keep people in Michigan. I mean, the co-founder of Google, right? He's, you know, he's not here. He spent his time in Michigan and, you know, and we need to find ways to keep the students that are already here and talented or the people who would like to get an education, we need to keep them here and make it affordable. The only other thing that I would say is that we need to try to find new ways to work with um, the existing industries and corporations to take the risk factor out of creating new businesses. A lot of people, you know, I, I totally agree with the kind of culture um, aspect, but I think that there are a lot of thriving entrepreneurs, but they're so afraid that they're not going to be able to feed their family or take a summer, you know, holiday or, you know, they're, they're so afraid of just, you know, doing the kind of day-to-day um, providing for the family that they don't go start those new businesses. So I think that with bigger corporations, with the automotive sector, with manufacturing, you know, with pharmaceuticals, with some of these other industries, I think we need to create almost intrapreneurs in those businesses and give incentives for people to have their day job, but to also start building, you know, their own businesses. So I've got lots of other <laughs> ideas. <laughs> I, and after, after I've had a couple drinks, the list gets uh, even, and I get more passionate about them, so I'm happy to share some of them. I believe the, uh, the governor may have a worthy adversary. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, no. Thank you, Angel. Chris, so we've talked before about, you know, with limited resources, we sometimes have to make tough choices. Are we focusing more on recruiting businesses from out of state or out of the country to Michigan, or should we be focusing more on, on home-growing uh, entrepreneurship? And, 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 you know, sort of pivoting into there, if it is focused on entrepreneurship, what are the ingredients that we need to continue to, to foster in this region to make entrepreneurship as alive and well as it is in other parts of the country? Yeah, th this is a good question, and, and, you and we have had this conversation before. I'm, I'm honored now to be serving on the board of the, the MEDC, maybe in part because I complained so much for so many years. Uh, my, my feeling was that for several years, we focused so much on elephant hunting, sort of going around the country to try and get 
the biggest companies we could to go into Michigan. And, and you know, anybody out here who's in sales knows so the, the fundamental, of sa fundamental of sales is it's a lot easier to get more business from existing customers than it is to get a new customer. And we spent an awful lot of time trying to get new customers, often at the expense of the companies that were already here. Um, and the, the second piece was uh, that unless you have a relationship with your customer, here, unless the state has a relationship with the businesses of the state, it's all about price. And so we got into this spiral of going after companies from out of state and basically just cutting really big checks to get them here. And so we got to the point where in 2010, I think we gave two billion in tax credits uh, out of the state, up like 20 fold from 10 years earlier. So we didn't have a relationship um, with, the, with the current companies in the state. And what happens then is if you can form a relationship and as you would do in sales, get to know the businesses that are here and help them grow, it's a much lower cost to the state. It's a much quicker impact. Uh, you know, the example I think of is when I first moved to Detroit and I bought my first car, I just started, you know, scouring around to see where I could get the cheapest car I could and it was purely a transactional relationship. Over time, I developed a relationship with an individual dealer knowing they were going to help me with service, they were going to help if, uh, if something was wrong. And it's so the same thing with the state. If as a state we're looking at how can we help the biggest issue that corporations here have, access to talent, how can we help in uh, handling regulations, how can we help in site selection, all those things we can do yield much quicker returns and they also, by the way, cost the state a lot less. So 2010, we gave two billion of incentives. This year, we'll give a little over 100 million of incentives. And anecdotally, we're seeing very strong results, but it's about execution. That, to me, is the way of doing it, which is to get into the businesses, and the MEDC, I think, is starting to do this very well, and figure out how can we help. The governor talked about the Pure Michigan Business Connect, but also the Pure Michigan Talent Connect. There are programs like um, Shifting Gears, which is helping uh, former workers in the automotive industry to shift into other jobs. New program called Shifting Code, which is addressing our severe shortage, shortage of, of coders in the state. And they're programs that can be implemented relatively quickly, fully using cooperation of the universities and businesses, and we, which should yield much quicker results. That's great feedback. Well, just a quick observation, because as we know, there are many myths about entrepreneurship here in Michigan. Um, as a venture capitalist, I back startup tech companies. And as I talk to my contemporaries on either coast, they often say, yeah, but is there the talent in Michigan to, to, to back these companies? And it was funny, we were doing a statistic and we looked at not only the ratio of engineers per capita, which by the way, I believe Michigan is number one or within the top five at least uh, in, the, in the country, but we looked at ratio of engineers to startup companies. And it's fascinating because on either coast, the myth is that there's all these all this talent waiting to go work for your startup. The problem is if you're a raw startup competing with Facebook or Google, you're gonna overpay if, and you're lucky to get a, a, a D-level uh, type, type talent. Here in Michigan, that ratio is way in our favor. So we actually, in fact, have a talent advantage. And whether we're launching a, start, a software company or an engineering company, I think taking advantage of the talent base that's here is, is a really profound way to drive things forward. Um, with that, we'd love to take some questions from the audience. Uh, I know that there's a lot of people here that, uh, that have been coming for many years and probably some fresh faces as well. What are you thinking about entrepreneurship and what can our panel answer for you? I know we have mics around, so if anyone wants to raise their hand, we'd be happy to answer your questions. And if I can just add, when we were talking, because you were talking about you know, being quick and making things happen very, very quickly, which is just absolutely essential to entrepreneurship, and I was talking about velocity and you were talking about talent. Um, in terms of what you know, Governor Snyder should do, like this, I really think that you're absolutely right in terms of us having an enormous talent pool. And so, for example, when I'm talking about creating these retail tech um, and creative clusters, I mean, Michigan is the home to some of the world's most phenomenal creative talent. You know, the the some of the big, biggest names we know in you know music, for example, come from Michigan, and not just the old stars. You know, the new ones too. Um, and I think that you know this whole new narrative really needs to embrace that that, that whole 
um, talent um, matter. But also when uh, when we're talking about kind of velocity, the you know if you talk about you know for example, I know to get a liquor license in Ferndale, it's it's pretty darn you know difficult. If I want to you know open up a restaurant, I, I know approximately how long it's going to take. I know in Royal Oak, you know it's also very difficult. I know in Detroit, it's also very difficult. And what what makes difficult from an entrepreneur is the amount of time it takes. So the amount of paperwork, the amount of the number of people I and have uncertainty. to uncertainty. Exactly the uncertainty, and so you don't you can't it's it's very difficult to build your business around the uncertainty, absolutely, and the amount of time it takes to get the essential ingredients together to really grow your business very, very quickly. So I think that you know we've got these amazing people here. We need to take away the barriers that exist, and a lot of the barriers are really just about how we do things. It's not investing more money. It's not creating more tax breaks, although I think we need to create some. It's it's about taking away the bar barriers so that we can move as quickly as we want. Well, that just, momentum exists. So I know we have a question, sir, here in the audience. Yeah, I have a venture capital question. And Angel, I got to say, I love the fact that you can truly describe yourself as an angel investor. <laughs> kind of cracks me up. But the, the question to the venture capital part of it is, what do you all make of crowdfunding? Is it going anywhere? Does it make any sense? Advice in going that route? What do you think? Rick, you want to take that one for us? I think that it's really interesting. I think uh, uh, things like Kickstarter and stuff are, are like an unbelievable validation engine. Uh, what better way to validate whether you have a product that the market wants than to pre-sell you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of it? Uh, as far as, as crowdfunding for equity and stuff, I think there's still a lot of regulatory uncertainty around that, but it's, it's clearly going to... It, I think it helps us as a state hugely move in this direction. Uh, so the more we can, again, try to get excited about those very earliest stage things, uh, tell the stories about those, uh, and, and work with them to, to fund them uh, both through pre-sales, but potentially in those sort of equity things going forward, um, the better. Chris, I need a comment. Yeah, so you know, I think crowdsourcing is great because 99% of the companies in Michigan will not be venture backable, and it doesn't mean they're not good companies. It just means they don't fit a certain model, but they still have, they still have capital issues. They have, they have capital issues getting bank loans. They have capital issues getting equity. So crowdfunding provides another resource for the great companies that just won't be venture backable. So it's, I think it's going to be really important in that regard. Yeah. I know we had a question right up front. Oh, you're going to hold I'm Jeff Padden with Public Policy Associates out of Lansing. You're talking about a whole series of initiatives and programs and so forth that could help improve the entrepreneurial environment for the state. Culture is something that's in the air, too. It's in the minds, it's in the hearts, it's in the souls of the people and the kids. If you could, what are the indicators that would tell you that the culture is shifting, that parents and kids think about entrepreneurship differently going forward than they have in the past decades. I'm gonna just quickly chime in, I'd really like to hear Dave's perspective, but um, so running a venture capital firm in downtown Detroit focused on all tech is a very non-traditional thing. And instead of our phones being silenced, uh, they're ringing off the hooks. They're ringing off the hooks from uh, kids graduating college saying, I want to build my business here. I want to be part of this, what's happening, because it's so darn cool. They're ringing off the hooks from people who started to, uh, their careers who moved away from uh, Michigan and now want to come back to be part of this, this hip community. So I think there's a, there, I, I can see this shift that's happening before our eyes, where once again, it's cool to be from Michigan and people are seeing that there is a cultural opportunity to build. Dave, how would you respond to that? You know, I was struck, a, it's a great question, I was struck a couple years ago by the, the youth riots in Paris. Uh, in, in France, to fire somebody can take two to three years, so coming out of college, nobody gets hired, their unemployment rate is 35 to 40 percent because it's so difficult to fire somebody. Nobody wants to hire somebody until you've got a proven track record. So the then president, Nicolas Sarkozy, passes a law and says you can fire anybody within two years after hiring them, and the, the youth rioted for weeks in Paris. And what struck me about that is that they were choosing security over opportunity. And I just kind of made the analogy, isn't that really what Michigan clung to for the past half century? We were, the world changed on us. We didn't change quickly enough. We held on to security over on opportunity. And really as entrepreneurs, that's the antithesis of what we do. I don't want security. The only security I want is whether or not my ideas work. If we launch a product and it fails, I really don't care what I, 
what drives me nuts is if we never try it, if we never launch it. So entrepreneurs don't look for security. We embrace and treasure opportunity. And I think for in Michigan, we were just like those kids in France. We just chose security over opportunity. I do think, to answer your question directly, I think what happened around here in 2008 and 2009 was so cataclysmic that, so potentially cataclysmic, I really think people said security, frankly, even if we wanted, it's probably not there anymore. And I am sensing uh, that the, the state has gone through a tipping point where we are embracing opportunity over security. And again, maybe part of it is because security just isn't there. Whether we want it or not, it's not there anymore. But uh, I, I really am sensing a, a sea change among us. Great point. Question here. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Gary Corbin from Accenture. And uh, we heard the governor talk uh, about these 80,000 or 70,000 people we have that are, are unemployed. We heard Jennifer Granholm before that tout these same numbers year after year after year. Got a bunch of bright minds up here, got venture capital, got innovation, digital um, expertise. Be really curious whether you guys have any sort of an idea around how we can get these 80,000 people that are you know, systemically unemployed back on the, on, the, on the payrolls and get them working and have that as a success story in Michigan. I mean, that almost, to me, seems like it should have been a to-do out of this conference three or four or five years ago. Ideas you guys have? Well, by the way, if you, I think you should take that as a to-do. That'd be great. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I, I think part of the question is, like, do they all need to go on somebody's payroll, or should we be working with, should, should there be more folks supporting them starting their, their own things? Uh, that's what we're trying to do with Star Garden. I mean, I don't know if... It, it, well, there, there's some that. friction, there's still some friction in, in, in skills, matching the skills with the positions. And, and that's a lot of the, the focus. You know, we've spent a lot of money in workforce development in the state in the past, not necessarily training people for the jobs that were there. And so there, the, the concept now is more of a real-time back and forth, getting businesses engaged in making the decisions, what are the jobs that we're going to need the next year, and, you know, and much more quickly creating programs like the shifting code I talked about, it's a two to three month program that gets people able to understand Java, HTML5, and Drupal because there are jobs that are gonna be there. The idea of training somebody and there's a job waiting for them in 90 days is pretty new to Michigan. And I think we're gonna to have to do that. It's gonna be the same thing with welding. And there are a lot of other jobs like that that are available now. We just are, we're close, but we just don't quite have the skill sets. And that's really where the state has to focus on creating these sort of innovative on the fly training programs so that that 80,000 jobs, you know, maybe 40,000 of which there's a skill mismatch, we can start to, to, to make that match. I also think it's about creating entirely new business models, right? So, for example, you know, we brought up kind of uh, crowdsource financing. I was on the board, I was on the board of two crowdsource finance businesses in the very, very early days and recently. Um, and, you know, so there are some things that really work and some things that are still issue like um, securities, et cetera. But I think these new models will help create, because I, I believe it's about helping them create their own businesses as well. Um, so uh, there's only so much influence we have over hiring decisions at, you know, at big corporations. So, um, uh, so for example, with Nonopoly, which is my business, it's not just about buying these properties and develop, developing, you know, those properties because they're derelict now and I want them to be you know, beautiful buildings that attract people to Corktown. Um, it's about entirely new models. So for example, I'm coming at uh, commercial property in the, uh, in the sense of trying to create an entirely new experience for consumers um, and um, about an entirely new business model where people who have skills but don't have capital, for example, to start up their own businesses, can participate. So for example, one of the things that we're looking at with one of our properties is um, people bringing trade um, into um, the building, trade that we need, skills that we need, in exchange for equity. So they would, it's basically like a time bank. So they're um, bringing in their time. We have a certain number of hours. We're constructing this model right now. And so they're doing it part time, right? They've got their own jobs, et cetera. Um, but they're starting to build up um, a whole new equity base that they're not going to be able to do at a nine to five. Well, are, is there even a nine to five job anymore? If you've got one, you're lucky. But uh, <laughs> I, you know, they don't really exist anymore. We're expected to be available all the time. But I think it's it's really just 
like looking tabla rasa at some of the models that exist right now and looking at, okay, what are the skills that we have and what is a way to create value for that individual? And you have to look at what is value for that individual. If they've already got a way to like pay the basic bills, okay, they still want to accumulate more wealth. How do they accumulate more wealth? They can start a new business or be part of a new business, but there has to be a model that works within their lifestyle. So the whole notion that we have this kind of nine to five lifestyle or whatever lifestyles we had in the past are, are really changing all the time. And it doesn't matter how wealthy you are or how poor you are, lifestyle is very, very different. So I do think we need to just start radically changing the business models today to really incorporate what's already happening. So all of those people, you know, some of them um, most likely have certain types of skills that they can offer, and it's creating a new model that generates value for a new business and for them. Do we have a question here? Oh, hi, Jeanette Pierce, uh, Dehive Detroit. Um, we, I think a few of you talked about the changing the perception, the conversation about Detroit and Michigan, uh, and from the outside, you know, so that people look at us from around the country, but. Sometimes I find that locally we don't even necessarily know what our own stories are, the own gems that we have. What are some ideas or ways that we can get everybody um, in this room and throughout the state telling that, the, the good stories, the, the great stories, and I'd wonder how many people even know where Corktown specifically is, right? Or the great things that um, Jerry and some of the folks are doing over there. So just some thoughts on how to get the word spread a little bit louder. So Rick, I think you've done a terrific job in Grand Rapids. I mean, spreading the word. I mean, Art Prize is known on an international basis. How, how can we do that? How can we tell these stories of Michigan success even more strongly? Well, I think there's a bunch of, there are a bunch of outlets that are already doing a great job of, of telling these stories. Uh, I think that when you read those stories, you need to pass them on personally. I, I, there's no grand overarching master plan to do this. It's, it's simply a matter of, of us all individually doing a better job of, of passing those things along. Uh, and then working with those outlets that aren't really covering uh, those stories as closely as they should have. So uh, in my experience, it's the new media that, and, and uh, digital media that is uh, most focused on this. Uh, we're interested in, in, in doing that, and that's why we, we invest in two things every, every week. We want that continuous story. So I think there's a lot to be said for uh, creating that flow. Um, and I think there's more um, interest than ever before. I have to say, you know, when I would, you know, kind of gallivant, you know, around the world, you know, professionally or just for fun, and I, you know, people would ask, oh, well, where are you from? And I'd say Detroit, they, oh, <laughs> you know, and there was this kind of real, you know, I'm sorry, you know, reaction to telling them, <laughs> telling them I was from Detroit. And, and uh, what I'm finding now is that there's intrigue. So when I say, oh, I'm from Detroit, oh, you know, so the first thing they'll usually say is, oh, I saw that, that the New York Times, the pictorial with all those derelict houses, that's a lot of times the first thing, you know, after you get beyond the kind of cars thing. Um, uh, but now they, there is an entry, they'll say like, oh, I've heard a lot of the artists are moving back into the city. Oh, I heard they're taking over whole neighborhoods. There's a lot of intrigue out there right now, and I think that instead of being embarrassed of some of these things, we need to say, like, yeah, we are growing organically. It's not this real kind of big push in any one direction. We're all taking little ownership stakes over the future of our city, the future of our state. And then, and then really kind of, I, I would, of course, advocate using social media as much as possible to tell stories the little stories that really resonate with people. When, when, you, when you're kind of reaching out to people on social media, the best thing that you can do is tell a really emotive story about your experience in Michigan. And it could have to do with anything, but it's so emotive and it's so general to all human beings that there's a connection there. And they want to share it with everybody else. So I think you know, the more that we can do about, yeah, finding out about these stories, we've got a storyboard right there. All of us should take a photo of it and share it with our friends. I mean, there, there are so many stories for us to, to share. Um, and I do think you know, we're doing a good job at, at, at doing that so far. But we need to increase it. Because like I said, I, I do, in my conversations, lots of different industry sectors I deal with internationally and here. Um, there, we're at the stage, I believe, of intrigue. So I've got, for example, four convoys, um, each with about 20 to 30 people that are all coming to Detroit for the first time. These are billionaires, they're multimillionaires, they're artists, they're musicians, 
Um, we've got property developers. I mean, there's, it's a really wide range of people who are coming because I'm just out there. You know, I, I'm, you know I, was, I was a soccer player, I wasn't a cheerleader, but I am a cheerleader for Detroit. <laughs> and so when I'm out there having these conversations, if you're telling your story with passion, then people want to come and find out. So these four convoys of people that are coming here, and I'm working with you know, some guys in Josh's team to make sure that they have the best experience, showing them the real stuff, not just the beautiful beaches we have, but showing them a really good array of what we have to offer. They're going to go away, and they're going to tell other people, and then I'm going to have to start up a whole new business to deal with, you know, with all the travel and tourism. Well, the story has certainly changed, and Angel has been a, a great uh, proponent, as, as is the other panelists. And I wish we had more time, but we do have to wrap up. The story of Michigan's revitalization has just begun. And I'm so privileged that all of us are really part of that story. And we all have a choice. You know, we can, we can cling to the past and do what we've always done and cast blame and point fingers, or we can hunker down and do something about it. And I believe this platform here in Mackinac and through the voice of the entrepreneur uh, will help us go to ascend to a place like none other in history. So as we conclude, I would like us to ask each panelist what is the outlook for Michigan's entrepreneurial scene five years out in one word? One word only, Mr. Dave Zoko. <laughs> uh, if I can hyphenate a word, I, I would say inflection point right now. I really would. It's inflection point. Chris. Outperform. Perform. I think we will outperform the rest of the nation. Eclipse, as in eclipse the former heyday status. Chaotic, but that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, as we conclude, I, of course, I want to thank our panelists. And I've, I, I want to say one word, which is innovation, which is, of course, one of these themes. And of course, I get to cheat as the moderator and say the second one, which is simply gratitude. Gratitude for all of us coming together for this event, for these incredible uh, panelists, and for all of us going out there to make the biggest possible difference here in 2012 in the state of Michigan. Thank you to the panel. Thank you.